Professor Kim Tagore. Okay. Professor Kim, yeah, mm -hmm. we start. We start. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming to this session. And I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me to chair this session because, uh, among other things, of course, Philip uh, Candelas will be speaking today, who is an old friend, a great mathematician, and a great physicist whom, from whom I've learned tremendously over the years. So it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be introducing him and chairing this session. Also, I think this is great that uh, Philip is speaking in. Cambridge right now. Uh, the, the event is hosted in India, and I'm here in East Asia, in Seoul, Korea. In Seoul. So, so very recently, if you'll allow me just one last statement, uh, you know, very recently I, I came upon this uh, quote from Kamran Bapa, where he emphasizes um, mathematics and science as a human heritage to which we all contribute, sometimes some places being better than others, but of course all of it being transient and all of us contributing together. Now, the event like this and the technology that enables it really seems to be a testimony to how much we all do the science together. And of course, Philip, a global citizen, um, represents this idea better than almost anyone I know. So he will be speaking about another kind of unity as well, uh, the arithmetic or family of Clavier manifolds, black holes, and modularity. Over to okay. you, Philip. Thank you. So <clears throat> let me thank the organizers for <clears throat> the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to speak in so many places at once. Uh, let me thank Min Yong for, for his outrageous introduction. Um, and uh, go on. I've got an easy task today because uh, Zenia gave a seminar on Tuesday and did most of the heavy lifting, if not all of the heavy lifting. So I have a rather easy time today. Um, so I think that will allow time for discussion if, if we want it. So let me just say that all of this is joint work with Zenia, with Duko van Straten with Mohamed Elmi um, and our two most recent students who uh, Puru Kusala has only just uh, uh, given his defense and Joseph McGovern, who is a continuing, a continuing student. So um, I was going to say something. I think we start with the, uh, with the vague conjectures. So, uh, I won't even state the vague conjectures in full, uh, but just to say that uh, associated with a manifold X, you can associate a local zeta function. And it was shown by Dwork, I think, that um, the zeta function is rational and it decomposes in the form shown. So I think this is for an n-dimensional manifold. Um, the dimension of the polynomial RK is uh, the kth Betty number. R0 and R2n are, are known. This is, R0 is 1 minus t, R2n is 1 minus p to the nt. We will be interested in the case that uh, n is 3, uh, because we'll be talking about Calabi-Yau threefolds. And uh, Dwork showed this by showing that RK is the determinant of one minus T times the inverse of the Frobenius uh, map acting on the kth uh, cohomology. So for a calabi yau threefold, let's consider one parameter of calabi yau threefold for simplicity. And then since B1 and B5 are zero, then R1 and R5 are just the identity. We're left with R3. Um, B3 is four, so R3 is generically a quartic. And we will drop the index on R3, so henceforward R3 will just be R. So I take it this is, uh, in this audience, this is, is, this is all very familiar. Okay, and Xenia showed that at an attractor point, 
that uh, H30 plus H03 is a lattice plane and the orthogonal plane H21 plus H12 is also uh, a lattice plane. Now, this of course is very unusual. So even if you, uh, here's, a, here's a diagram I, I drew to show to physicists. Um, if you have a line in a lattice and it passes through the generic line, of course, will not pass through a lattice point, as in the, the red line, but the blue line passes through a lattice point. And if it does pass in through a lattice point, then of course the slope is necessarily uh, rational. In, in this case, uh, it's three over six, so a half. So um Now, our case is that we have a four-dimensional lattice, this being the dimension of H3, the, the third uh, cohomology over the integers. And um, we have a four-dimensional lattice, and H30 plus H03 is a two-plane, H21 plus H12 is another two-plane. And these have to be lattice planes. In other words, these are planes that they pass through lattice points such that each of these planes intersects the lattice in at least two linearly independent uh, vectors. And this, of course, is unusual. This is uh, sort of a, the statement that, that a slope is rational, but that you want two slopes to be rational. So it's uh, presumably very special and uh, very rare. You wouldn't, you perhaps would think it would never happen. Um, and this is the case that you are dealing with a, an attractor of rank two, which is the case we're going to be discussing today. So um, R again is, the, is this determinant of one minus the T times the inverse of the Frobenius. And what we're saying is that the lattice, the four dimensional lattice decomposes into two two dimensional lattices over the integers. And so this Frobenius matrix uh, which is a four by four matrix now breaks up, but you could choose a basis such it breaks up into two by two blocks as indicated. And um, therefore the determinant is going to factorize. And so it factorizes as, uh, as shown. Let's have a look, I think that's okay. Uh, I'm wondering why I have an arrow. Let me get rid of the arrow. Um, so there's one part which, which corresponds to this plane H12 plus H21 and one part which corresponds to H30 and H03. And so our strategy, we want to find, of course, this property that the planes intersect the lattice in particular ways is, uh, depends on the parameter. H30 plus H03 is always a, a two plane, but it depends on what you call a three zero form. And so it depends on the complex structure parameter phi. As you change the parameter phi, the plane moves around within the lattice, it's only for special values of phi that it will coincide with a lattice plane. And similarly for the uh, orthogonal lattice. So what we're going to do is look for cases that this happens. So we want to find particular values of phi for which it happens. And um, what we're going to do is look at for what we're going to call particular persistent factorizations. So the idea is that for special values of phi, the um, lattice will decompose over the uh, integers. And what did I mean? What I mean is these lattice planes will intersect the the, uh, uh, the lattice in linearly independent points, as I said, um, and it will only happen for certain values of phi. 
And when that happens, then the Frobenius polynomial, which is generically a quartic, will factorize as indicated into two quadratics. Uh, Philip, could I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, just to be encourage interactivity, I suppose. But um, uh, what you said just now, that's not a theorem, is it? I mean, you are assuming that the Hodge structure factorizes. That doesn't automatically imply that the Frobenius factorizes without a bunch of conjectures, right? Ah, well, okay. So I stand corrected. Um, I see. So it involves the Hodge. Hodge conjecture or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think, yes. So we're assuming yeah. the Hodge conjecture. We're assuming we haven't found a, a counterexample to the Hodge conjecture. Or, yeah, um, no, I think that I, you've done a lot of numerical experiments of this sort of course, right? But I guess it's worth emphasizing because, in a sense, you're finding evidence for the Hodge conjecture whenever you verify these things with your computations, right? So, I see. Okay. Well, that's a, a good thing to do. So, um, indeed. <laughs> I mean, I should say that for years, um, I've been drawing a salary under false pretenses and that I draw a salary as a professor of mathematics when really I'm, I'm a physicist. So, um, so you must allow for that and, and no, correct no, me when I say things that are not true. No, no, not at all. It's, 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 you, but, you're, uh, you're, you're expressing a deeper truth, I think. I see, <laughs> okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do all this over fp for many values of p so i will just say what what we're what we want and we want what are called the what we're calling these persistent factorizations so what we're really looking for is a, a, a polynomial g of phi possibly reducible with rational or if you prefer integer coefficients and we want to find such a polynomial such that the roots of, of g uh, are the values of phi for which this factorization occurs. So in this way we hope to make contact between the rationals or the algebraic numbers and uh, numbers mod p. Okay, and so what we actually do is compute these uh, Frobenius polynomials for many values of p and phi. And at the beginning, we started off by computing for 500 values of p. So I think from p is seven to the 503rd prime, which is something like 3,583. And this is a small table. So you can imagine, you see, for each uh, P, you write, you have a table, phi belongs to FP. So phi can take the values from one to P minus one um, or from zero to P minus one. And um, so some of the tables become very long, but here's one from the beginning of the list. So for P equals 19 and if you look down the list, then there are values such as, for example, from uh, phi is two, where you have an irreducible quartic, and phi is three is an irreducible quartic. Uh, for some cases, you happen to hit a singular value of phi, so one for which the uh, manifold has a conifold singularity. And there, for example, 16 and 17 are in this uh, one, 16 and 17 uh, fall into this category. And there, <clears throat> the quartic becomes a cubic and moreover uh, factors into a linear factor and a quadratic factor. And there are pretty, there's a pretty story to tell about those. Those also, the quadratic factors are modular. Um, but it's not what we're after today. What we're after today is a case where it factorizes into two quadrics. And this happens for five cases for p equals 19. And those are the cases highlighted in yellow. So uh, I want you to remember for a few minutes uh, the five numbers for which this happens. So four, five, eight, nine, and 
11. I mean, it's not critical you remember, but it's nice if you remember. 4, 5, 8, 9, and 11. Now, what we do is, well, the crudest thing you can possibly do is you make such tables for 500 primes. And um, then you simply count how many times uh, it factorizes, how many times the Frobenius polynomial factorizes in the desired way um, for that prime. So we've just said it factorizes for p equals 19. So p equals 19 is the, the dot on this diagram that uh, I've highlighted. Um, for p equals 19, it factorizes uh, five times. Now, you can see it actually factorizes quite a lot uh, on this plot. And if you compare it with a plot along the bottom, so all this was done for the hulet verrill manifold. So a certain, uh, certain Calabi R manifold, which we could describe, and Zenia did describe, I think, on Tuesday. Um, yeah, Zenia did. So uh, I won't describe it again. Um, but if you compare that with the <clears throat> plot along the bottom, which is presented for comparison, and this is the plot, the corresponding plot for the quintic, there you see that um, factorization is a rare phenomenon. Uh, and no, for no prime does it happen more than three times, at least no prime in this range does it happen more than three times. And for a great many primes, it doesn't happen at all. You have a lot of, pro a lot of points on the, uh, on the axis. Whereas for the hulet verrill manifold above, there's this striking feature uh, at the beginning, uh, the, stri the striking feature, though it took us a little while to see it, there's, uh, you, but you're supposed to immediately see that for every P, the, uh, the Frobenius polynomial factors at least once. Right? There are no um, points on the axis and there are points at level one in the, in the diagram. Excuse me, Philip? Yes? I'm not sure you can do something about it, but I can't quite see. Uh, maybe it's just me. I can't quite. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Is there something I can do? Or? Oh, no, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think it was just my screen. You know, I can see it. I just didn't oh, okay. see the top of the, of the, of the okay. table. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Now, the fact that it always factorizes, it always factorizes at least once leads you to think that if there's a polynomial that, whose roots determine the factorization, that polynomial must have a linear factor because a linear equation always has a solution, uh, almost always has a solution. It has a solution with probability one. So there's a, uh, an exercise you can do. Well, you can either run through linear equations with in integer coefficients on your computer, or there's a variation of the uh, Chinese remainder theorem that will do this immediately, where you see you look at the values for which the, there's a fact, there, there is precisely one factorization, and you ask if there's a rational number whose reduction mod p uh, which has, uh, uh, what, what am I saying? Yes, you ask if, is there a rational number whose reduction mod P for those values of P gives you the value of phi for which the factorization occurs? Right, so the, the, the factorization occurs for a certain value of phi valued in FP for every P. And you ask, is there a single, some rational number which reduced mod P gives you that value mod P for every case where it factorizes precisely once. And you immediately find that that value is minus a seventh. Okay, so what we're saying 
for the hewlett verrill manifold, there are always factorizations when 7 phi plus 1 is 0. And this is something you check immediately with the computer. And then if you have a graduate student, you say, well, there's a linear factor to this polynomial g of phi. Perhaps there are more. Is there perhaps a quadratic factor? And again, you could do a computer search, but you can also give this to the graduate student. He goes away with a computer for a weekend. And uh, on Monday, he comes back and he tells you that uh, factorization also always occurs when phi squared minus 66 phi plus one equals zero which to me is when, when phi plus or minus, so the phi plus or minus the roots of this equation, phi plus or minus the 33 plus or minus eight root 70. Okay. Now, for P is 19, so let's just say what this means for P is 19. P is 19 is the table we looked at a minute ago. For P is 19, we know that we remember that seven times eight is 56 which is three times 19 minus one. So modulo 19, seven times eight is minus one. So modulo 19 minus a seventh is eight. And eight was indeed one of the numbers that I asked you to remember. And moreover, 17 is six squared, six squared minus 19. And so is equal to six squared modulo, um, modulo 19, and if you compute 33 plus or minus eight root 17, which is, you will see that five plus or minus is four or five. And so, and that four or five were two of the other values that I asked you to remember. So this is how you observe it, that, that uh, we're saying for each prime, you look through and you ask, what are the solutions to these equations modulo p, of course, the quadratic equation may not have a solution modulo p um, unless 17 is a square. But in the cases when, it, when these equations do have solutions, then does factorization occur? And you find that it always does occur. Okay, so we found a, uh, a polynomial which has two irreducible factors. So one factor being seven five plus one and the other irreducible factor being this quadratic equation uh, such that factorization always occurs. Okay. Um, now, having done that, you read off the charges. So you go back to Xenia's lecture, you read off the charges of the uh, black hole and once you know the charges, you feed the equations in, you feed the flow equations into Mathematica and you ask it to do a flow plot. And indeed you find the attractor flow that you can start in the, anywhere in the plane. And the uh, phi will evolve to this red point, which is minus a seventh um, in, the, in the plane. The other, Let's have a look, use this. So this is the attractor point. This is the large complex structure, phi equals zero, the, the, the dot with the, with the hole in the middle. And these are the conifold singularities. This is one over 25, one over nine, one over here. Um, and so it uh, does this. Now, what we've done is used a, an arithmetic procedure to find this number. If you try and guess this number, well, usually it won't happen at all. If you try and guess uh, the charges, which are integers, then um, first of all, for most manifolds, it won't happen at all. Um, if you guess wrongly, then uh, the flow will not flow to a point 
a smooth manifold. It will not flow to a point in the middle of the moduli space, but it will rapidly either run off to infinity or flow into one of the singular points. Okay, so that's what's special uh, about this. Okay, then there is more information in the tables than the existence and location of the attractor points. So at say phi is minus a seventh, uh, the Frobenius polynomial always factorizes into this form. And then there are modular forms of weight two and weight four. So weight two for the first factor and weight four for the second factor for the group gamma zero of 14. So this is an observation by comparing with, by writing, looking at tables of the alphas and the betas and comparing with LMFDB, the, the, the database. Um, it needn't have been the case, I think, that they were both modular forms for the same group, but it is the case in the, the, here, um, and such that F2 is the sum of alpha to the n, q to the n, and, and alpha p is the pth coefficient in that sum. And F4 is the sum of beta to the n, q to the n, where beta p is the pth coefficient in that sum. So if you're a mathematician, then this was expected. I think, um, if, and you would have been surprised had it not been the case, but um, if you're a physicist, then suddenly modular groups and modular forms have appeared out of nowhere, and that's highly, highly surprising. So this wasn't a case, for example, that we can see gamma zero of 14 in the definition of the manifold in any way that, that we've seen so far. No, Philip? Yes? We're still on the hulek vera manifold, is that right? Yes, yes. No. And two and seven are the primes of bad reduction for that, is that right? Yes. For this value yes. of i, that is what, yeah, thank you. I believe so, yes. Yes, yes, I can check quick. I can check afterwards. But um, That's right. were two and seven the primes of bad reduction? I think they are. I think they are, yes. Right. Sure. I think That's they are. Right. Uh, there may be another yeah, one. Yeah, they are even, yeah, yeah. Fact, yes. Yes. Even yes, 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 yes. In the paper, so there's a paper. Um, yeah. And the paper is. Uh, Zenia Dukovan Straten, Mohamed Elme, and myself. Um, and in that paper, we calculate. I'm wondering if we do it in that paper, but certainly in the paper with Dukovan Straten, Zenia, and myself. So there was another later paper um, where we examine several manifolds. Mm. And in there, we are careful to calculate which primes are primes of bad reduction. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And that's uh, we give the primes of the bad reduction there. Yeah. Sure. No, I was just saying that that's what the gamma node of 14 comes from, I suppose. Right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so then. Something we were looking for, and something um, which was noted in the physics literature, is that if you calculate the periods for this manifold, there are four periods, since, since B3 is four, there are four periods, and um, there will be two linear relations between them. But working up towards that, let's write down something that let, let, let's actually point out a fact that we didn't in fact expect at the beginning. So 
given a modular form of, of weight J, there's a way of associating an L function with it as a Millen transform. Presumably, I could have written this down as a product of the Euler factors, and perhaps that would have been more interesting, but um, let's write it down here as this Mellin transform uh, anyway. So it's defined this way. Um, so we take Tor is uh, pure IY, and so Q is e to the minus two pi Y, and we integrate um, Tor over imaginary values uh, from naught to I infinity. And so we get an integral mm -hmm. like this. And then we notice that at phi star, the periods of omega are given by simple rational multiples of critical L values, L41 and L42. The two um, L values related to the modular form of weight four. And if someone wants to know what happened to the modular form of weight two, I'll happily answer that question in a moment. So um, there's a natural basis of the periods, call it psi j, j runs from naught to three. Um, and uh, these are real. And when phi is minus a seventh, we have the relations that are shown. Um, there's a trans there's a sort of transcendentality degree associated with this in which L of two has transcendentality degree two. So it's asking to be divided by pi squared and psi j has transcendentality degree j. So it's asking to be divided by pi to the j. Um, and so in writing out this table, I've divided all the, the quantities by the appropriate power of pi. And you see that the size are related to up to these factors of pi, that the size are related to the L values by simple rational numbers. Um, and this being so, there are indeed two linear relations between the values of the periods. So let's just move on to those. Uh, so if we define psi twiddle to be psi j divided by the appropriate power of pi, then we find these two linear relations that psi naught twiddle plus three psi two twiddle is zero and 11 psi one twiddle plus five psi three twiddle is zero. But going back, we actually have more. We actually have um, what the periods are in terms of the values. And of course, uh, in general, of course, you wouldn't expect any relation, any rational relation between the values of the periods. If you pick some random value of phi, then um, the periods will be some transcendental numbers, and there won't be any rational relations between them. At, a, at an attractor point of rank one, you would expect one relation, and at a point of rank two, you get two relations. Okay. Um, so now let's go back. So I said, that given a value of phi, say phi is minus a seventh, you could calculate the charges. And since it's an attractive value of rank two, it means there are two linearly independent sets of charges. Um, and those are the vectors that are shown. Um, there's a number kappa here, which is one or two, because then you explained that in order to obtain the hulik ferrell manifold, you're really taking a quotient, and that quotient can either be Z5 or Z10. Um, and kappa is one for Z10 and two for Z5. So um, there are really two hulik ferrell man manifolds, one parameter hulik ferrell manifolds, if you like, with kappa taking the values one or two. Um, but there's a two, you can take a, a two parameter combination of these vectors with integers k and l, and 
Curiously, if we let V star be this combination of L values, so there's a, a seven, there's an L4 of two, there's a pi L4 of one, the factor of pi has been chosen to, uh, to be the appropriate one given the transcendentality degree of the L values, so that V is, has transcendentality degree zero, so to speak. And given phi is minus a seventh and K and L, you can unscramble the value of the radius at the horizon. And so you can compute the value of the area of the horizon as four pi r squared. And you get a, uh, an expression that is remarkably simple in terms of this quantity V star. So here you have it. Um, there's an overall coefficient of 14 pi, which I just noticed uh, 14 was the value of the conductor. And um, I don't know of a better reason at the moment, except we're going to see it again, this relation again in a minute. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a fact that 14 appears there. And then you get this very simple form um, in terms that involves just uh, the value, the L values through this quantity, through this quantity V star. Um, and the point here is that this sort of formula is something that clearly has physical, uh, a physical interpretation. You're saying the area, you have a black hole, the area of the horizon of the black hole is this quantity. It's a surprising simple formula, but it contains this number V star, which is built out of these modular uh, functions of gamma zero of 14. And this uh, is something, well, the simple form wasn't particularly to be expected. And that these constants that appear here sort of contain um, facts about gamma zero of 14 in this essential way wasn't uh, anticipated at all. So um, let me, if there are no questions, uh, I guess the point is, is a physicist at this point, I think is surprised because the modular functions appeared out of nowhere and here they are entering into a formula of with physical significance. Uh, let me just say it again for the other attractor points. So, for these other attractor points at phi plus or minus uh, is equal to 33 plus or minus h root 17. Uh, in this case, you find a similar story, except that now the group is gamma one of 34. The uh, Euler factor takes the same value uh, for both phi plus and phi minus. Uh, it factors into a, a weight two piece and a weight four piece. And there are modular forms whose LMFDB designations are given at the bottom of the slide. So there's a weight two piece for gamma zero, a gamma one of uh, 34, and a weight four piece for gamma one of 34. So again, the same uh, modular group. And we can calculate. Uh, the area in a similar way, it turns out that, um, well, the L values are now complex numbers, but the complex, the, the real and complex parts are related in a very simple way. So the, the uh, imaginary part is a simple multiple of the real part. So we let lambda four be the real part of the L value. And uh, you form this combination for which I have no particular insight, except that it makes the answer simple. But you define V star to be this combination of constants that's shown. And the formula for the area now turns out to be 34 pi as the overall factor. And 34, of course, was, is again the conductor. So I have no uh, feeling for this, except that 
a coincidence that occurs twice is possibly worth noting. And um, then you get this very simple formula for the area in terms of uh, a quantity V star, which again is built out of the, the L values. So this again is sort of interesting. Um, and the area, of course, Bekenstein and Hawking say that the entropy of a black, black holes have an entropy and the entropy is a quarter of the area. And so there's some mystery to this because that's, you believe this is said for large black holes and this may well be true also for small black holes. So the entropy you wouldn't expect to be exactly given by a quarter of the area, but only to be given by a quarter of the area in some sort of asymptotic limit in which the black hole is big. Um, now, the entropy you believe is essentially the number of ways you can put the black hole together. So it's actually a very interesting uh, number. And you believe that there may be degrees of freedom that you know about or you don't know about, but um, there are some, in, uh, in some sense, fundamental degrees of freedom and the entropy um, is the number of ways of putting the black hole together. Now, uh, the area, a quarter of the area is in some sense that entropy or in some limit that entropy. Um, and the fact that the area is given in terms of L values and modular forms suggests a counting problem that you may well be able to explain that you might be able to explain what the fundamental degrees of freedom are in terms of whatever it is that the modular groups are counting. Um, but so I leave that open as a sort of a very interesting and intriguing fact. Of course, the fact that we found these special values of phi, the special values of the attractor point because of these very special conditions that uh, the planes became lattice planes. Um, those are not exactly, those are not approximate conditions. I mean, whether a number is rational or irrational is not an approximate statement. So there's an interesting point here whether these formulae might be exact. They're not just true in, in some sort of uh, asymptotic limit, but actually, actually completely true, uh, we have to see. Okay, so. Sorry, Philip? Yes. I didn't quite understand. Uh, you said something about something that the modular group is counting? Well, modular forms often, well, modular forms, as you know, have often integer coefficients. And those integer coefficients often correspond to some counting problem. You mean uh, counting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are often counting problems. Count the number of partitions of a number of an integer n, and so on. And then there's the modular form. Um, <clears throat> there's a modular form whose coefficients count the numbers of partitions of a, of n for each n. Yeah, no, that's why um, so there are similar coefficients of modular forms. Yeah, okay. Yes. So uh, modular forms are associated with uh, counting problems of various types and various degrees of sophistication. Yeah. Now, there's clearly some counting problem associated with the area of a black hole, and we're relating it to numbers made mm. from modular forms. So um, there may be quantities that the coefficients of the modular forms are counting, which are interesting to a physicist. May I ask so, a question? Sure. 
Uh, you have <clears throat> two modular groups, gamma naught 14 and gamma one of 34. Do you happen uh -huh. to know what the genus of those curves is? I think we do. Uh, I only have to answer Xenia, I think. <laughs> For gamma, gamma, for the gamma degree of 14, if this degree of 14 is the genus one. Yes, so genus that's one. right. So it's okay. genus one, right. It's now, genus one. your zeta function formula strongly suggests a connection to elliptic curves. So it, is it too stupid to ask whether your Kalabi Yao actually has a map to the gamma naught of 14 elliptic curve? Is that a dumb question? No, I, th I think Hodge asks this or conjectures this question, actually. Um, so, well, we haven't been able to find it. So, so the speculation is that there is some such construction. So, the factorization that we conjecture over the integers of the Hodge structure um, presumably derives from some special geometrical property which exists for that value of the parameter. Like and perhaps that, 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 that uh, property is that there exists an elliptic surface or something like that. And but just for that value of, uh, uh, of the parameters, if there's a special value of the parameter for which an elliptic surface appears, and it dissolves again immediately as soon as you move the parameter. So something like that. And then you might conjecture that the elliptic curves in this surface are x0 of 14. So- Okay, thank you. That, that, that might be true, but we haven't found it. I mean, we would very much like to find such a thing. Yeah, uh, could, I give, could I say something? Maybe sure. if you have this elliptic curve, then you take a triple product of this elliptic curve. And then uh, if you quotient out with some, um, involutions uh, or some automorphisms, then pro probably this triple product will cover your Calabial threefold. Then the uh, all L functions uh, factors will uh, occur as this uh, factors of this triple product elliptic curves. Well, that might be true. And uh, well, that's have, to, have to check, have to check. Yeah, th that's right. So we have to check. So um, this might be might be true. And uh, something like this uh, is supposed to be true if the Hodge conjecture is true. So oh, yeah, for this example, without Hodge conjecture, you, you can just calculate. Well, okay. I mean, it would be surprising if we had found it. Because a uh, you are saying uh, uh, modular forms count number of rational points and so on. So uh, at the level of point counting, uh, you can do this for this example. Okay. Well, uh, if we, if so, if one can check, and uh, if it turns out to be true, then I think we're pleased uh, because at the moment we don't know. There's a message in the chat. Yeah, Armand Brunner is asking, is it really gamma 1 of 34 and not gamma naught of 34? Uh, I believe it's gamma 1 of 34. OK, mm. then uh, I think there might be a problem, because I can, uh, according to Shimura, I think uh, there would not be an elliptic curve, but there would be on your surface. Well, I think that that was, was we were talking, yes. So I, I, I was talking about the case phi is minus a seventh, where the group is gamma zero of 14. Um, I'm not sure what happens for gamma one of 34, but something similar ought to happen, but it might be different, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. And oh, for once, we're doing okay with time. This is, is not, this is, 
very unlike me to do well with time. Okay, so um, oh, let me get my picture back. Okay, and then uh, it is particularly uh, appropriate that, 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 that Mignon is chairman because um, yeah. is, is, is chair, sorry, I'm being corrected. Um, that Mignon is chair, that um, uh, he told me at some stage when I, I showed him a preliminary version of this, he said, look at the, the Cheba Tariyov theorem. So, um, there, there is something you can say using the Chebotaryov theorem. And um, I discovered, a, we discovered a proof of the following statement and we discovered it on math overflow, but we can now prove it for ourselves that um, if you take an uh, a polynomial that's irreducible over Q and ask how many roots does it have over FP on average, then the answer is always one. So uh, there's an appendix in our paper which in which this is proved, but as I say, it seems to be a well-known thing. And uh, the, of course, if it's a linear equation, then it has a root for almost all P. Um, and if it's a quadratic equation, then of course it has two roots half the time and no roots the other half of the time. So again, it has one root on average. And then for higher degrees, of course, it becomes more complicated um, owing to the, you, the classification uh, to do with the Galois group. And this is where the Chebotaryov theorem comes in. But the answer is that the uh, that, that this business with the Galois groups cancels out. And so um, the, on average, there's always one root. So if G of phi, that our polynomial has K irreducible factors, G has on average K roots. So here's, our, here's the, the graph at the beginning, except now that we do it for a thousand primes, and we put the, the primes into bins of 125, those the, the uh, blue blocks, and we compute an average. And you can see the average falls down and it's somewhere, it falls down to some number between two and three. And we went to uh, a thousand primes because if you go to 500 primes, that's the first four blocks, you could see that it's only a little, you see, if it's only, it's only a little below three, and you might have said, is that number really three? But if you continue to a thousand primes, it continues to fall. I think you could say that it looks as if it's falling towards two. Now we already have two factors. We had this factor seven, five plus one, and the other factor, which was, Phi squared minus 66 phi plus one. So we already have two factors. And so the number, the limit always has to be greater than two. And so it, it seems likely that this is falling towards two, but it means that there are no other factors. So if you'd said, to, you know, if I look harder, will I find other values of phi for which there are attractor points? Then um, it doesn't seem that there are. Of course, there's no theorem that this graph doesn't pick up again if you compute even more primes, but uh, it, it's looking as if, as if we found the, the two irreducible factors. We found the two irreducible factors and there aren't any others. And uh, here's the corresponding graph for the quintic. And uh, you see even, even the first block is below 0.5 and then it falls very rapid falls rapidly and the last block is below 0.1 in fact and so um, people have tried to find uh, attractor points on the quintic but you can see that um, you shouldn't really try Okay, so I think that's uh, where I'll stop and I'm slightly under time, which is good, and um, I'll take questions.
Thank you. No, let's first thank Philip for this wonderful talk before asking questions. Devendra probably didn't know that when you make me chair, I tend to abuse my privilege and ask the first question even during the Q&A session. So if yeah. I could ask the first question first. Uh, yeah, you, you can just tell me not refuse to answer this question, but I was just wondering, this process of calculating the black hole area, the event or area of the event horizon from the club EO attractor point, is it easy to describe what this process is? Is it very complicated? No, there's a phi, there's a function. So phi mm. is the parameter, and Xenia described how phi is a function of the radius. So you have, so the picture is you have a, a spherically symmetric Calabi owl. So the only important right. dimension uh -huh. is the radius. A spherically symmetric, sorry, spherically symmetric black hole. So the four mm -hmm. dimensions is a spherically symmetric black hole. I miss that. You have the radius then as the only important dimension. Over this radius, you have fiber to Calabi owl. Each, mm -hmm. each Calabi owl has a parameter <clears throat> phi, and phi depends on the radius sure. in a certain way, which is governed by this differential system that, that Senya wrote down, basically the Einstein <clears throat> equation. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, I see. Right, so there's a differential equation that phi of r uh, solves. Right. Um, and this involves the charges, and the attractor value involves the charges. Once you know the attractor value, you know the charges, uh, you know the value of the radius. Mm. I'm saying something wrong. I guess you're just, I, 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 uh, yeah, uh, you know the area anyway, the, you know the area at the horizon. So you know phi as a, fu as a function of r, uh, you know the value of r for, at the horizon. So, uh, and then you have a metric also, which is given in terms of r, and um, you can put all those together and compute the, the area. It's not a difficult calculation. No, no. No, it's just, it would be interesting since given your area formula involves all these arithmetic quantities. Uh, I, I mean, obviously we want to see, I think, if that area <laughs> can be expressed in some other way that is arithmetic, right? Yes, well, yes, 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 yes. and. Uh... If you could have expressed the area as some sort of counting, mm. then that would be extremely interesting. That would be interesting, but that wouldn't necessarily explain the relation to the L values, right? So, yeah, yeah. There's a lot about this that we don't understand. Indeed, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Sorry, I should ask whether other people have questions. Uh, I have one more question about your zeta function formula. You have <clears throat> two factors. There's a, a factor associated to two, one, and one, two, and yes. then another factor associated to zero, three, and three, zero. Yes. Now, am I, am I correct in thinking that the two, one, one, zero part has weight two? That's your weight two modular form? In yes. your in your setup, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Okay. Now, yes. I, I, I just want to point out in your zeta function formula, there's an extra p value in front of the uh, <clears throat> in front of the eigenvalue, <clears throat> and this suggests that the p adic valuation of those roots is higher than you would get for an elliptic curve. What well, what yes, I'm suggesting? The slope is one two. Slope is one two. Y yeah, that's the hot two. polygon. Hot polygon. Yes, what I'm suggesting is that that is a slope decomposition of your F crystal. That's what I was trying to, to argue. So if you go back to your zeta function formula, there's something called the slope filtration. And 
I'm, I'm not sure if this is exactly right, but it suggests that that slope filtration splits into a direct sum. So you yeah, have- Let's say a, the, the, the slope is one, two, and zero, three. So if you take a product with the zero, one, three, so that's nothing but the hot, hot polygon. Yes. So in other words, what, what seems to happen, this goes back to what Min Hong Kim was saying that, Knowing the Hodge decomposition doesn't tell you about the decomposition of the, if you want to call it the crystal. I mean, that's a conjecture, but it seems to suggest that you have a decomposition of that crystal into its slope pieces. So I, this is just a question more than a statement, but the very shape of your zeta function formula suggests that that's true. So there's something called a slope filtration of an any F crystal. And it gives the p-adic valuation of the roots. And if you go back to your zeta function formula, you can clearly see that the 2110 factor has an extra p factor in it. The slope, yes. the p-adic valuation has gone up. And that factor, it's divisible now by p. Yeah. And so I'm yeah. simply asking this as a question more than giving it as a statement. <clears throat> um data function form it's, it's clearly displayed in the in the way in which that that thing is no 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 i mean yeah, right there you see that, that there's a p in one right uh, p, right p in and that's, one factor that, that, that doesn't appear tells you, in the other factor that's right that p tells you that the p attic valuation of those are already jacked up by an amount okay so those are the slopes though the p attic valuation of the slopes now, in any F crystal, you have a slope filtration. As Noriko was saying, this is given by the Newton polygon. But it seems to suggest that in these special values, your F crystal, the slope filtration, splits into a direct sum for some mysterious reason. It seems to suggest that. And so I'm simply tossing this out as a question. Well, as long as you're not tossing it out to me, then that's OK. Um... <laughs> Well, to the audience, I'm talking it out to anyone. No, in the because uh, for this example, hot polygon is the same. Newton is the same as a hot. Uh, so, so, so uh, in the elliptic curve situation, we call this the ordinary case or case three surface the ordinary case. So this is the ordinary example. It's uh, right. hot is hot is the lowest because of a maser. Uh, Newton is above usually hot. But then in this example, Newton coincides with Hodge. Yeah, but I'm suggesting something further that the that the slope filtration splits as a direct sum. This is a this this is the very exceptional behavior on the on the Hodge side where you have a splitting of the Hodge structure into two. That's very exceptional as as yes. Philippus. But then uh, if you go to the Galois representation side, this Galois representation four-dimensional is a tensor product of two two-dimensional Galois representations. That's what it says. Right, right. So this is a splitting of some kind and that special value. So I'm tossing out this as a question to the audience. There are people here who know about some of these things. But that seems to su be suggested by your, your data. Well, that could be. Um, perhaps I make one comment, which is although um, we've been talking about a particular example, this is really a method rather. Um, and it's a method that starts with A differential equation. So you have periods, and the periods satisfy a Picard Fuchs equation. And from the periods, you construct everything. From the periods, you construct the zeta function and so on. So there's a sort of straight road starting from a differential equation to a zeta function. And A, E, S, and Z made a list of Picard Fuchs equations. 
And Killian Burnish and Clem and perhaps someone else. Uh, and, and Zagier, and so let's say, it. let me say it properly then. So uh, Killian Burnish and Albrecht Clem and Don Zagier and Emmanuel Scheidegger, mm -hmm. Scheidegger uh, took this and found more examples, more manifolds which exhibit attractor points. I think all their examples, they found one attractor point. And Joseph McGovern uh, only two. Only two? Yes, they, 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 they did two, 14 examples. So they have two fourteen cases, and only two. They have two more. Yes. Well, they, okay, so they looked at 14 manifolds. They yes. looked at 14 yes, yes. manifolds. Yes, no, 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 one parameter families. Yes. Hypergeometric. Okay. okay. And Joseph McGovern, our students, so there's a, you know how it is with students, you can't stop them. And uh, Joseph McGovern has become interested and every couple of days he sends us an email that he's found another manifold. So um, there are quite a lot of these things. I, I'm not sure whether there are a lot or a few, but, but, there's far, but, but there are now a few examples known, but um, it's not, it's not just this who that very wonderful. Um, I don't know if we're supposed to be stopping now, uh, Devendra. Yeah, if there is no more question, we will be stopping suddenly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, if, if I could ask one last question, I'd appreciate it as chair again. <laughs> yeah, <we'll be. laughs> Uh, uh, Philip, I, I, I'm asking because I, I suppose you must have thought about this. There are these well-known counting problems for black holes that do give rise to modular forms, right? These BPS type. Yes. Problems. Yes. So, so what is the what are your thoughts on the relation between what you've done and the, these more standard computations? I would like to understand the relation, um, and. Well, we're here, and I suppose it, we, you could argue that we're supposed to sort it out in Cambridge because um, uh, Samir Murti is here and, and, and mm -hmm. Don Zagier is here, and, and they've been involved in some of these, uh, computing some of these relations that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out what their modular forms have to do with these modular forms. Yeah, I mean, a priori nothing, right? So. <laughs> well, okay, but it comes back to this counting business. Right. Yeah. No, that's okay. interesting. I hope you sort it out anyway. Yeah. Okay, so bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks. Let's, thanks, let's Professor Kim for sharing. Great, great, great talking thanks. to you, Noriko. Yeah, all Bye. right. Thank you. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.